So I, I really liked work on the Magic Cloud and Praxis management. I wrote the IGA before it got retired. Not my choice, but uh, it got retired. Uh, but um, the access management has to be my my proudest moment in research. Uh, perhaps the second one I wrote. Uh, and remember what I said about the, the, the balance on, on entertainment with information, right? So there's an interesting Easter egg in that magic quadrant, if you guys look it up. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself? Good. I was just thinking back to um, something that was brought up yesterday in one of our all-hands meetings. One of our leaders was talking about, um, you know, how she had run into a situation where she went into a store and showed the clerk, hey, I can get this for $20 cheaper on Amazon. And the answer that she essentially got was, go order it on Amazon. <laughs> you know, it's like... Good Wrong advice. answer. <laughs> well, it's good. Yeah, it's honest advice, mm -hmm. but it's not a good way to run a store. And mm -hmm. it got me thinking about my last time going to the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport to pick up Denise, and the place smelled like a subway station. I mean, literally, I've been going there to for years, well over five years in the because this is my local airport now, and it's it's gotten worse and worse and. Now it smells like a subway station in New York City. In other words, it smells like like an open bathroom. Horrible. <laughs> and and all you can do is say it's poorly managed, right? The person who's running that place should realize such things and make sure that it's run better. Okay. So it, that's my my general gripe for the morning. It's not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm a really happy go lucky guy, but I want you know I always try to start the show with something. And that's I don't understand your high standards of an airport not smelling like a bathroom. I mean, you must be really highfalutin <laughs> and, you know, very, no, very hoity-toity. <laughs> I've just been traveling a lot. You know, I've been a road warrior for 25 years, not so much over the last five years, like many of us. And, um, it, man, air travel has gone downhill significantly in that time. It's not, it's not fun anymore. And so I don't mm -hmm. know if it's me that, like, I just don't like going through the airport hubbub, but I think it's that the quality of air travel, the airport experience, the airplane experience, they've all gone downhill significantly. Yeah, it's the, it's the new bus. I think it's gotten so affordable that everyone's doing it, and it's race to the bottom for low costs, carriers and seats. And, you know, I fly Delta uh, pretty much exclusively at this point, and for as much as they think that they're a premium airline, they're not. <laughs> I mean, they're, they their used airplanes to are be. old. They maybe, but not not in the three years that I've been flying with them. Definitely not. They're no better worse. or worse than anyone else. <laughs> no, they've got a lot worse than what they were. And it's, a, it's we're not going to dump on Delta for forty five no. minutes. <laughs> but way to start <laughs> us off with a real, with a real upper of uh, yeah, smelly smelly airports. So thanks for that, Jim. You're we're off to a good start. <laughs> All right. Why don't we talk about Identiverse? Because that's going to be fun and hopefully doesn't smell like an airport. In fact, it'll be at the Ari uh, Resort and Casino, which never smells <laughs> like an airport. I don't even smell the smoke really in there, which is great. I'm not a smoker. So, um, you know, clean air. Let's hope for that. And that's May 28th to the 31st. We've got a discount code. You get 25% off. It's IDV24 IDAC25. We'll have a link in our show notes because I know that's really easy to remember. We're way past, I think, uh, you know, early, early bird discounts are only a couple weeks away. But hey, if you're a last minute. No, by the time this drops, it's one week away. It's exactly yeah, one exactly. week so, from the drop date. You got, you know, a week. The, 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 the discount code still works, so feel free to use it. And Jim, you and I will be there. We'll be doing a bunch of podcast stuff. I'm hosting a panel on CAPE, uh, Continuous Access Evaluation Profile. So, um, you know. We'll, we'll find out more about that. We'll be doing podcast episodes and just kind of, you know, galvanting men around town. How does that sound? It sounds good. We've got a discount code for Identity Week. 
Europe, America, and Asia. They this discount code works for all three of those different conferences. It's IDAC thirty. That gets you thirty percent off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll be at the one in Washington D.C. September eleventh and twelfth. So come out and see us there. And uh, yeah, so support for the show, show support for the show. Easy for me to say. So again, links will be in our show notes. You don't have to remember those. Just check the little thing below <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube mm -hmm. uh, or check, uh, you know, the notes in, in your app. Um, I don't want to like delay this because I feel like this is a conversation that we've been waiting for for a long time. Um, the shackles are off. Freedom is being embraced. So I want to welcome to the show Henrique Teixeira. He's the Senior Vice President of Strategy at Saviant. Welcome finally to the show, Henrique. Finally, finally, guys. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Super happy. As you said, shackles are off. And, uh, and Jim, uh, I'm at this hotel here. I'm at RSA, and it, it, it smells good. <laughs> Have so you run into any RSA. bad smells so far? Here in the room is okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll we'll, li we'll limit it to that for now. <laughs> So, Henrique, we, we've had some conversations in the past. You're at RSA. We'll talk about that in a second. But I guess technically, this is your first time appearing on the podcast. We did a thing at Gartner, uh, I guess it was early last year now at this point, 2023. We did like a, a live kind of session with you and Becky on stage. But if you weren't there, you kind of missed it. So let's start from the beginning with you, Henrique. How did you get into identity? Is it something that you chose or did it choose you? It chose me, uh, definitely. So it was in the late 90s when I started. And I, um, I ended up with a company called BMC Software. Uh, if you guys remember BMC, uh, right before they acquired R R Remedy. And uh, I didn't know anything like that. I didn't know existed something like consulting. So I, I, when, I, when I left university, um, uh, I had this opportunity to, to work with a services integrator for BMC, and I was deploying Control SA. Control SA was one of those user provisioning tools way back when there was a couple of vendors uh, doing what they do. And, uh, and that's how I got in. I was uh, implementing user provisioning for a while. Um, and funny story is when BMC decided to move away from identity, they spun off that part of the business, which later became assets of SailPoint uh, later on. Um, but that was my first job. And then uh, was a sequence of other identity roles in different companies. Computer Associates uh, was next, then IBM. And of course, I'm Brazilian. Uh, that was all in Brazil. Um, after uh, Computer Associates, uh, IBM, uh, I joined Oracle. That was... Um, uh, my last job in Brazil before moving to Canada and Oracle, I was in charge of the sales of all identity products uh, for the Brazilian territory. Uh, but yeah, no, the, the profession chose me. And I, to be very honest, I, I thought at times, hey, maybe I, I should di diversify and, and try something different. And, and every time I say, hey, maybe identity is, is, is done for now. And, and it's not going anywhere, uh, but then something new came up, right? And then, and then if you remember, um, uh, at one point, especially when I was at CA and they bought Integrity and they were in the web access management um, uh, phase of the market, I said, okay, this is kind of interesting. And then it died, died down a little bit. Uh, then came Okta with, with SAML and a whole new way of doing single sign-on. And it was exciting again. So all this roller coaster. And, and which really, really excites me. Right? So we, we never know what's coming next. But uh, uh, ironically, uh, and I end up at Garner. So uh, this, this was after I moved to Canada and all that. But to your question, no, definitely the, the profession chose me more than I, I choosing uh, knowingly where this was. I was learning as it went. And I, man, I, I, I really got um, enamorated with this subject. So you mentioned Gartner. We're definitely going to get into that. But you also mentioned RSA. I guess this is—is is this your first time at RSA? And if so, like, what's your impression of RSA as a whole, as a first timer? It is a first time for me. Yes, first time I'm here. Um, 
I'm, I'm quite impressed. I, I think uh, I knew what to expect. Uh, I, I heard there was ups and downs, different years, different vibes. Uh, I, I think I heard people telling me, wow, it feels like pre-pandemic. Uh, and that's that's the vibe. People that come here many many years, they're telling me, oh, it's 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 bustling again, and 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 people seem to be excited to be here. Uh, I I I love San Francisco as a city, right? And and I, I, it's a beautiful city. And I've been here for other events, but yeah, this is the first time here at RSA. Uh, one thing I, um, which, which struck me is that of course I, I ran conferences for Gartner and. All the expo, the show floor, it's very standardized, right? So it's all uniform. And, and I hear here at RSA, you, you see all kinds of shapes and forms of booths and, and, and marketing and colors. Uh, and that's kind of refreshing. I, I like it. Yeah, that's what I kind of wanted to ask you about, Enrique. With your time at Gartner, you know, my, in my head, it's <laughs> Enrique who runs the... Um, the I am summit. And I think back to how you made that first move to bring it into grapevine, Texas, but I even wanted to start before that, which is how did you get that job of running the conference? It's a, it's a funny story, Jim. So, uh, at, at that time I was a senior director at Garner. I, I had my fair share of accomplishments, if you will. Um, I have authored a, a couple of magic quadrants by then. Um, and there was a previous guest on this podcast. You guys may know him, David Mari. Uh, so David and I were very close friends and I, I look up at him, say, uh, whatever David was doing, say, Hey, I, I, I want to be more like Dave in that sense. I totally, totally respect that guy. Anyway, uh, I was on vacation in Mexico with my family and, um, I get a text from my boss and I was at the pool and the text says, Enrique, we got to talk. That was it. Hmm. Nothing else. It's usually not good. This is not good. That's, that's, that's the vibe I was going for. Right. And I told my wife, man, this is weird. I, I think I lost my job and uh, I just didn't know what to think. And, and I tried to call Ray Wagner. Uh, right, he's my he was my manager at Garner at that time, and uh, no answer on the, the time zone differences and etc. So I, I went to sleep and I, I couldn't sleep. It was hey, uh, am I fired? Am I what what's going on? Right, and um, I wake up next morning and and finally he's like, yeah, are you are you free now? I say yes, I'm free now, and 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 I call him. And what Ray tells me is, hey, Enrique, uh, David Mari just left Gardner. And uh, I'm calling you because uh, I want to know, uh, do you accept to be the next chair of the IM Summit? I say, man, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that to me. So, so that's how I, I was offered the job in, in, in a sense that... Um, of course, I was doing other things in the background and, and, and producing my research. And I think uh, I was next in line, but I never knew. It was uh, out of the blue. And uh, Noah was so happy, but at the same time, angry at Ray. <laughs> well, we um, we love David Mati on the show. We've had him on at least once. And uh, he's over at Transmit Security now. Um and I look up to him as a as a bodybuilder, weightlifter as well, because the the guy's pretty jacked in addition to everything. But so now, you know, going back to the story, so now you got this new role to be the chair of the IM Summit, and you don't know what you're doing, right? I mean, <laughs> you've never done it before, at least we can say that much. So, what was that like? Do you mean uh, what was like? leaving Gardner to join Saban or about the role itself? No, I'm talking about running, running your first IAM summit. Oh. Like you changed locations. You didn't just, you know, follow the template that was laid out the previous time, right? You, you took the Brought world by the class horns podcast and kind of like, to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You invited <laughs> us and included us. That was pretty brash. 
Very much, Jim. And, and you know me. I like to think of myself as a little bit of a mover and a shaker uh, type of thing. And say, hey, we, we need to snazzy this thing up, right? And make it um, more appealing. And, and especially if you guys remember, right, this was after COVID, right after this. So it was the first in-person event at Garner um, that we had. Okay, so we, we did not know how, what to expect. So it was not only me. Uh, new uh, on the job, but also we're we're coming back in person. Uh, so it was a new thing for attendees as well, right? Um, so it, it was very weird. I think uh, uh, Garner was amazing in that regard. And 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 Ray came to me and see, hey Enrique, even if nobody shows up, even the, if this event sucks, uh, you you are on the clear. And I said, no, man, what are you talking about? It, it has to be a success. We got to make it work and it will be a success. I have a reputation I want to keep. I cannot embarrass Gartner, right, in, in, in our audience and our clients. So, no, it will be a success. So uh, we thought of, of, of ways or I thought of ways that, okay, we, we got to change up a little bit. Uh, Number one, if you guys remember, before the pandemic, Garner um, conferences, all the breakout sessions, they had a duration of 45 minutes. And during virtual sessions, we shortened that to 30 minutes. When we came back in person, it stayed as a 30-minute session. It, it was a big change if you think about the way we were producing content, tell a story in 45 minutes. It is easier than telling the same story in a, in a very efficient way in 30 minutes. So that's just an example of the whole mechanics changed for that. And, but there was this, on the other hand, a very accepting and, and with, which uh, lift a weight off my shoulders to say, hey, Enrique, even if this goes south, um, uh, you were good. But uh, I think that gave me more freedom to try weird stuff and, and, and new and, and interesting things. So uh, in, in a sense, I was ex very excited. I, I, and, and I loved it the first time I did it. So even though, Jim, I, I've never done that before, I say, wow, I want to do more with conferences at Garner. And, and by the time I, I left Garner, uh, that was one of my favorite things. It was to be on stage and, and to help other people to succeed as a speaker uh, to be proficient as a speaker. So um, it, it is funny, right? So you, even things that you never done in your life, but if, if opportunity presents yourself and, and if you never try it, you never know if you're going to like it or not. That's right. That's right. That's great advice. I will also say I had a great time at the event. Um, the venue was <laughs> awesome. Didn't smell. Um, you know, Jeff and I held a community uh, outing one night uh, we did axe throwing. It was sponsored by Okta and One Cosmos and RSM. And we basically were able to bring out some of our listeners to come do axe throwing at no cost. So that was a fantastic time. Now, I had a learning come from that, which was, you know, we did that at an offsite place that did axe throwing, of course, and we didn't provide transportation. And I think that was a big miss because people had to get themselves there. So they had to go and get an Uber. I said, oh, that'll be all right. People will do that. And I think that hurt our attendance. Um, what what learnings did you have coming away from organizing conference? In other words, if the the person who now got that phone call, like Enrique's uh, left, and now I want yeah. you to run the eye of something, what's the what is the lessons learned that you would pass on to them? Oh, so many. But uh, let me try and, and distill to something that's more actionable and, and memorable. Eh? So, um, so two things. And, and, and you brought up a good point. So the, the, and, and when you say the venue didn't smell, we had two venues, right? So the first one was in Vegas. And then, uh, to my surprise, the next event was only seven months away from the first one. So remember, so there was a double challenge. Uh, the first yeah. event being in Vegas after the pandemic. The second event, we moved it to Texas seven months after the first one. So again, we say, hey, you only have seven months. It's okay if the rooms are empty. And, and man, I was sweating bullets. Uh, I, I was having nightmares uh, and real, uh, real nightmares that I was walking to rooms and, and going on, on stage and, and the seats were empty. <laughs> so 
I, uh, so this is the advice. And I say, hey, yes, we need killer content. Yes, we need to be talking all about the good and, and actionable things in identity. But we need those rooms full. Okay? We need to, to uh, balance the entertainment aspect as well as the content. Right? I don't want to be say, hey, I, I'm going to go to Garner, but yeah, it was boring. I think people remember what they feel in those events. So I say, hey, we, and, and I was lucky that my manager thought the same way. So yes, we got to balance out entertainment with this. So uh, the, for the second event, I say, hey, we're, 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 we have this very short window. I need big, big tickets, uh, names that could attract people, that could be interesting. So uh, I had the idea of bringing you guys. So you, you came to, on the second one, right? So it was a Texas one. And I said, hey, we want those guys in. Uh, but is this really a, a case study? Because that's this lot. Garner had this very formulaic approach. Okay, is it a case study? Is it a Garner speaker? I said, no, this is a podcast. And it took a while for Garner to understand. I said, this is an example of, the, hey, try something different. We, we took a chance with you guys, but I, I knew it w was going to work. I, 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 I was certain. For example, and so this was one. The other, the other thing I, I, I came up with this idea was to bring CEOs on stage. So uh, originally I had invited uh, Todd McKinnon from Okta, uh, Mark McLean from SailPoint, and Andre Durand from, from Ping. And eventually uh, Todd had a conflict in his agenda, and we, we brought those guys. So Andre and Mark on stage, that was a first I think, in, 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 for IAM. Other uh, data analytics and other summits, they had that before. So I had some, some sort of um, prior uh, um, things similar to that. But it took me over six months just to convince Garner processes, of, hey, we're going to do this. So I had to come up with a very specific uh, inclusion criteria, why those guys are there and not. So I was mostly focusing on the professional and personal journey they went from uh, an employee in a company so they they both quit their jobs to to be uh, a, a founder of a company and the ceo so you got to be the founder and the ceo um, and if i was still a garner I, I would continue with that idea that was such a, a a great turnout and 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 feedback that i heard uh my next idea would be to bring um women uh women leaders in identity and, and, and bring them on stage. So those are examples of uh, taking those calculated risks, right? Just like inviting Jim and Jeff on stage. Say, hey, so how is that going to be? I, I think there are very interesting ways of calculate a risk, take your chances, and, and always try to balance that, that entertainment with content. You got to make your audience understand they're having a good time. And they will remember to have a good time. They may not remember what they heard. It was a centralized identity. It was a Kim, my TDR. They, they're going to remember they had a good time. So I think that's if that's one advice I'll give to a, who is getting into this business or into this conference industry is, hey, think about your audience having a good time. That's a really cool story. So the analogy that I came up with as you're telling the story was like they took Steve Jobs and dropped him in at IBM and he said, think differently. And the audience said, eh, yeah, <laughs> I what, don't what know. <laughs> Why do we need to think differently? We've got a framework that works. We're thought leaders. And, and Gartner analysts are thought leaders. A lot of people stop there with Gartner to tell us how we should think about this problem. What's the future? Okay. You're a thought leader. You're up on that stage. Um, and it goes back to, okay, we talked a lot about your role as a conference Um organizer but that was just more i think what happened latest right before that or probably even really during that you're an analyst first talk to us about what the typical day of an analyst's life is like yeah there's the external stuff which is very easy for people to see so every time you are at a Gardner conference so you are on stage you're presenting this right so uh the analyst is typically doing three things Every analyst, uh, it's a very similar role when you're, you are at Garner. So one is writing research, right? And when we write that research, the second thing you do is to prepare 
uh, and you select and cherry pick the coolest research and that turn into presentations that you deliver um, in those conferences, right? So it's to promote that in a way that is packaged in a, in a breakout session. Uh, the third thing we do, and that's not very visible to a lot of people, I did not know that before joining, joining Garner and taking the job, was inquiries. And, and that was a big chunk of my day, four hours a day, every day, I was talking to IAM leaders and CISOs. So uh, writing research, presenting that research on stage, but also this increase. So it would be like five, six CISOs a day telling me, hey, Enrique, I have this issue with uh, machine identities. I have this issue with user provisioning and onboarding or SSO. Who should I buy, Okta or, or Microsoft? So it, it, it was um, um, a very important piece of the job, not only to, to help those companies, which is a, a very interesting thing that you learn how to do in a very short time frame. So every inquiry like that is a 30-minute conversation, not too different than the one that we're having here. So it's about listening a problem and provide them, you can say, hey, let's have a, a weak assessment and I'll turn you with a response. No, an inquiry is like, I understand your issue in a very short time frame and I can give you one, two things that you can go and do in a very actionable way in that 30 minutes. So you become very uh, compact and, and efficient with your words and I... I was a guy that I always enjoyed to talk and perhaps I, I, I think, hey, am, am I speaking too much? And I have to pace myself and, and, and pay attention to that. And, and that translates in how I communicated with my clients, but also even my family, my kids and my wife. <laughs> so that research that you did, you, did, you, I guess, kind of invented things like Kim and ITDR. Um, when it comes to things like that, and so Kim cloud infrastructure, entitlement management, ITDR, identity threat detection and response. Uh, what are some of the, like, are those the things that you hang your head on and say, like, I did this, like you printed out that research and put it on your refrigerator at home. Like, what are some of the other things that you feel like most proud of having worked at Gartner and some of the research you produced? Yeah. And, and creating markets or creating segments or acronyms, it's uh, and it is a funny thing, a Garner. Um, my my manager once said, "Hey, Enrique, there are analysts at Garner that they have a whole career, Garner, and they never created a, a, an acronym or analyst that never authored a magic quadrant. It's not a mandatory thing. It's not a requirement for analysts to be creating acronyms, uh, even though the market is, yeah, Gardner, they, 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 they have the bonuses attached to how many acronyms they create. No, there's no such thing. So I want to debunk that myth right now. But uh, so, yes, there's, a, there's not a pressure for analysts to be creating those type of stuff. But um, man, it was such a, a funny thing. I was, I was watching this market and a bunch of startups coming out of stealth and create this thing and say, hey, this is different. And when I was looking, I was just observing this, like in a, in a lab, you see like a Petri dish and say, hey, this thing is growing. And what do I call this? And I, I don't know if you guys remember, uh, uh, and I, I, I create a few posts about this. I at first said, well, this sounds like a cloud access governance of entitlements. So, so I, okay, let's call this cage. And we, we use Nicolas Cage's face as the icon for this. So this is going to be Cage, and we cage the entitlements in it. And uh, it didn't get accepted, but I think the second That's a real missed choice, opportunity, Henrique. I would have been in on that Right. <laughs> they, they slept on that one. That was <laughs> right there for the taking. I mean, Nicolas uh, Cage so licenses they... all the time, right? He, he totally would have probably like said, yeah, throw me a few bucks, and you can use my face on it. <laughs> His career will go over the roof, right? Uh, and um, and same with ITDR. I say, hey, there's a, this whole new thing of, of companies. And, and so this kind of observational uh, type of thing uh, was something. Hey, I, I was just, I'm just writing about things that I see. And if it, is it real? Is it not? Is it, well, I can see in front of me. It's happening here. I, it doesn't matter much what we call it. 
but that was pretty cool. Uh, I think, yeah, it gives me pride. I think it's always going to be there. So it's part of history now, right? That this this things got created at ITDR and 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 Kim. Uh, so um, I feel very proud about this, especially because it, it help help people in two ways. Uh, number one, the startups, and I'm 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 so. How can I say? What's the English word? And you guys know I'm, I'm English is not my first language, but uh, I I, uh, I admire those guys. Uh, the courage of just hey, I'm going to be launching this company out of nowhere, or I, I, I we don't have funding. We're going to have and raise raise a a round of funding. And uh, so number one, having this type of hey, now you have this acronym and you can attach it to it. You, you put a label on what you do. Uh, they can explain that to leaders. Hey, I solve this type of problem. I am I'm doing ITDR and I'm doing Kim. Uh, I think helps them, but also it helps uh, the buyers, right? So if I'm an IM leader, say, I, yeah, I don't want to get breached, uh, and I I'm, I'm doing a good job here with IAM, uh, MFA, and, and IGA. All the plumbing is done, but uh, I'm still getting attacked. Okay, there's this ITDR thing, so I'll look in companies in that space. So I think it helps to shorten that that conversation uh um time frame and and helping from those two sides but yes to the refrigerator question you asked uh if i'm the my most proud moment uh, i think the biggest red research i ever published was the magic quadrant uh hands down and i'm i'm, I'm super proud of them and it's a it's a funny comment about this jeff is that uh uh, many, many times, uh, li- like people told me, you don't have to write an MQ uh, to be a good analyst. It's it's not a mandatory thing. And, and, or, or even people saying, hey, it's a nightmare to write an MQ. You're going to get escalations. You're going to get, uh, you're going to piss people off. And so you know what? No, this is, this sounds very cool. I want to do that. This, this sounds a very powerful research that can drive markets we can really help uh, leaders to make informed decisions and uh um so back to the the thing on on, on the conferences too so y- you never know if you're gonna like it if you don't try it but i i had a strong feeling i would like it so i i really liked work on the magic club and practice management i wrote the iga before it got retired not my choice but uh, you got retired uh but um the access management has to be my my proudest moment in research. Uh, perhaps the second one I wrote. Uh, and remember what I said about the, the, the balance on, on entertainment with information, right? So there's an interesting Easter egg in that magic one, I mean, if you guys look it up. Uh, so there's a, a, a section that people don't read that often because everybody looks at that chart, right? Uh, we, we see the actual quadrant and the, the dots in the quadrant. But way down, there's the context section. And we talk about where the market's going, what's influencing those shifts in the market in direction. So there, there's sections. And I, I, I'm going to tell here, and, and you can look it up later if you have a Garner subscription or not, or a reprints out there in the internet. But uh, this each title of that context section of the magic quadrant that year, it is a star Wars reference. Hmm. So there is a, uh, yeah, the, the rise of the developer and, 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 and so on. It's a, and prize no, to anybody, anybody who, who finds it. And next time they see Jeff or I and, and can identify it, we've got an identity at the center sticker as a prize. Henrique, yes, I wanted it, to, I wanted to ask you a follow-up question on ITDR, if I could. Um, so I was listening to another podcast by the Cooper Cole folks. Mike Neuschwander, I think I'm getting that right, wrote a, um, a guidance paper on ITDR. And he made the statement during this podcast that ITDR is a use case, not a product. And I think, you know, further explanation was, look, all these ITDR, all these um, platforms or systems that fall into the ITDR bucket, they have some number of features that kind of fall into this grouping of ITDR. So yeah. in my opinion, now we're talking Jim McDonald's idea. I think of ITDR, the most important part 
as essentially almost like watching from a UBA standpoint, looking for unusual activity that fits a pattern of potential breach in action, and then being able to respond by taking some action to to stop the breach in its tracks. But it sounds like also within this ITDR space is an analysis of your configurations within certain identity systems to say, oh, if you keep that configuration, you know, that's a, that's a bad configuration, et cetera, et cetera. Another one that was talked about during the podcast, and I think he was uh, referring to a, a system called Sempris, which is that there are some tools for restoring your active directory in this case, if, you know, if a breach does take place and is successful. So it's like some have some components, some have other components. And I kind of feel like where we're at with ITDR is we're going to see three, four years down the road. Who knows if it'll still be called ITDR. I think it's a genius acronym for it, but you know, all these things are going to have to flush out and like, you know, it's going to have to focus on something, some set of use cases that every platform supports and everything ex extraneous to that will either fall by the wayside or fit into some other category. What are your thoughts? Yeah, and, and funny story, because of RSA and, and everybody's here, uh, I met Mike the other day and we had lunch together. So how, how fun is that? A, a, almost like a former garden analyst with cupping your coal and, and all that stuff. So, so super cool. And I, I agree. Um, we were very adamant to explain that ITDR is not a market. It, uh, a Garner, we called it as a discipline. It is a discipline because uh, it encompasses tools of markets that already exist. So think about it, right? So it could be part of XDR. It could be part of an IAM tool that brings ITDR capabilities. Uh, it could be uh, an intrusion detection system. It could be a, uh, a, a honeypot uh, deception technique type of tool like Elusive, and, 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 which is now proof point, right? So, um, so those markets already exist. Um, yes, you may find perhaps a vendor or another as a... a I only do ITDR and I, I don't I don't fit as an endpoint security tool. I don't fit as an IAM tool. It's it's something. Yeah, there are there are a couple of those I can think perhaps Silverfort uh, fits in, in in that area of, of what um, Automize was starting to do after Kim, right? They started Kim and they they add more ITDR pieces in there. So, uh, but for the most part, uh, what ITDR included is uh, and knowledge base, best practices, tools. So that's why we, we package that as a discipline. And, and every time I was talking about ATR in, in, in presentations, we, we called it a discipline. We say, hey, it, it's not a market. And, and, but that's a very good question because we, we, we used to get that a lot of garners. Hey, when are you launching in MQ, a magic quadrant for, uh, for ATR? I said, well, it's not a market. So until this becomes, it has to exist as a market to become a magic quadrant. So, um, so that's why we wrote other best practices type of documents, but not MQs about it. So it wouldn't be uh, an identity center podcast if we didn't ask about AI. <laughs> I feel like it's obviously having yeah. its moment right now. Uh, we're all, you know, speculating at this point. I don't think anybody has answers, but I think we have lots of ideas on where we see uh, AI impacting identity on, on any number of fronts. I'm curious, where do you see AI hitting the, a the IAM world? I think number one, recommendation engines and co-pilots. I think uh, that's one of the, I, I can see here at RSA, but I was already starting to see this beginning of this year, a lot of pilots uh, and a lot of uh, 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 demos around uh, co-pilot ideas, uh, assistance, right? Especially for IGA, I think it's a, one of those more applicable areas where AI can can be used to augment humans in, in decision-making. Uh, uh, and not only in Gen AI, okay? I'm talking about perhaps all kinds of different type of AIs for action, uh, for uh, the traditional analytics, uh, or what we call advanced analytics, which is predictive and prescriptive 
analytics. So becoming more prescriptive in the in the type of analytics that we we do, uh, I think those are more tangible ways of using AI for security or AI in IAM. So closer to, hey, you should be running a certification campaign right now because I, I, I did run a peer group analysis here. Analytics is telling me um, there's an over accumulation of privileges in 10% in of your users, right? So things like that, AI could be very helpful, but this is analytics that already existed. It's almost like now we have applied analytics to solve specific problems um, versus the idea in the past that we have analytics and identity. Yeah, we, uh, we're generating this data warehouse and you can do anything with it, right? I, I, the analogy I use, yeah, you can take that block of wood and a Swiss army knife and carve out a guitar. Yeah, you could, but should you do that? No, maybe not, right? So I, I think that's where we're starting. And, and Jeff, I agree with you very much. I, I don't think uh, if you ask somebody and they know exactly how AI is going to be used, uh, I'll, I'll call that bluff. Eh? There's there's no way somebody if this this ah, I know exactly that we're going to be using AI for this today, and I know exactly how it's going to be using next. Uh, but there's definitely two sides to it. So we spoke first, and this was the example I gave of using AI for security. But there's also the the um, the security for AI, right? So we protecting organizations against threats generated by AI. So I'm going to put you on the spot here because I was at RSA a few years ago and I was happy to come back to the podcast and report that zero trust had been solved because every single product that I saw as I walked through both vendor halls had some sort of zero trust, you know, branding or solution or whatever. So it was like, all right, great. We've got that figured out. As you walk through the vendor halls at RSA this year, give me a, a gut feeling. Where are we at with AI? Are, are most booths have something to do with AI? Do they have you know things like that where they're kind of promoting their AI capabilities? W what's your gut feeling? Everybody, I think it's almost like mandatory for CMOs <laughs> to put that on booths. It's like, ah, oh, this is crazy. Well, my booth at Savient, we have AI in there. We're, we're la they're launching. Uh, we're launching this this new co-pilot called Savy, right? Uh, or Savvy, and I think we're going to be calling it Savvy. Savvy the co-pilot. Savvy sounds better, I think. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but yes, to your question, I, I, I think it's it's. It's becoming like what Zero Trust was. Everywhere, every booth, every vendor has some different flavor of AI. And uh, yeah, and, and I think as an analyst, right, we start to observe those type of patterns and say, yeah, it's natural. Uh, it doesn't surprise me at all. It doesn't make me angry or no, no, it's, it's, it's how the market works. And then uh, we've seen that before, right? And so it's, it's just this, this new thing. Before AI, it was cloud. I don't even count crypto. This, is a, this was a weird blip. Yeah, but, blockchain uh, was big uh, like five years ago. <laughs> right, and uh, I think all those startups that used to do blockchain, okay, now we gotta do AI as well. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think it's very predictable <laughs> to make a, 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 a pun here. Uh, uh, this would eventually happen, right? So it's the same with cloud, eh? this cloud revolution uh, or uh, zero trust revolution, uh, the AI revolution until the next revolution. I can guarantee you it's going to be a new one after this. Hmm. You know, I, I'm just going to throw my comment out there and feel free to argue with me. I um, And I think this, I've pissed people off with this comment before. I think recommendation engine is not AI. I don't think it's very valuable. I think it's very similar to the concept of role mining. And I've gone in with, oh. worked with a lot of clients in the past where it's like, hey, let's do this role mining exercise. And it says 50% of the people in this group have this combination of entitlements. So just give it to 100%. It's like, oh, no, we're smart. We're not going to give it to 50%. Or if it's only 50, oh, it was 70%. So yeah, we'll give it to those other 30. That is in dead opposition to the principle of least privilege. Dead opposition. So I am, I've, I think it can be an input, but I don't mm -hmm. think that's AI. I don't think having an input 
of data. Now, Copilot, now we're now you're talking my language where I can use kind of human interaction with my IGA system to yeah. mine data in a way that I couldn't before because I couldn't develop, I couldn't even use maybe some of the data analytics tools that were provided because I'm not a techie or whatever, but now I can start to drill in and whether I'm a techie or not, does isn't really actually the, the point. It's how easy is it to use the system to mine that data, to extract the meaningful information that I need. So when we're talking co-pilot, yes, you I'm sold. We're talking about recommendation engine. I do think a lot of vendors are going to have recommendation engines because I think it's it's something that's been around for years with role mining. And then it's just like, oh, let's just put a new user interface on it or let's maybe take it to the next step. I just don't find it that valuable. And Jim, but what do you think is the difference between a co-pilot and a recommendation engine? Is, is, what, what is it in your, in your opinion? So in, in my opinion, from a co-pilot standpoint, it would be like using an interface from a chat GPT or a Gemini or something like that, where I say, oh, give me the top 10 you know, meaningful identity and access management metrics. Okay, and it'll say 10, and then you say, well, actually, give me a, a sentence behind each one. Now give me, um, I only want the top five or something like that. Actually expand uh -huh. that out, include this other point of view, things like that. Now write me a report about those 10. Now it's like, I'm just interacting. I'm just barking out commands to the system and it's taking the data and it's using the generative chat feature to, you know, create pros or create answers that are human readable and probably yeah. better than I could write myself to take my identity data and make sense of it. And you're absolutely right. I, I think uh, there's a, a com we're conflating two things. Uh, and, and when I say we, is, I'm, I'm talking about our industry eh? uh, of co-pilots and recommendation engines. Because you, you are right. Um, b before Gen AI, we had many IJ vendors that, that can do a risk score, right? I say, hey, you should approve this certification because the risk is low. You should deny this uh, request because the risk is high. There is already very good analytics happening in there. And that's different from, okay, now let, let me transform that graph into natural language, right? And, and make this uh, accessible to other uh, citizen developers, citizen employees that are not even IT oriented people. I think that's the power of it too, right? So to make it more democratic, uh, the democratization of identity, if you will. So uh, there's this angle as well that we cannot hire fast enough a skilled people in identity. So when I think of co-pilots, it's, it's, yeah, it's augmenting the capacity of humans to make good decisions on identity. Uh, and I, I'm, and I'm, I'm not talking about a trainee new on the job. It could be a CISO. It could be a CIO. I say, hey, can you imagine a CIO? And I, I've met those leaders uh, in a smaller organization, a mid-sized organization. Maybe the CIO is also the CISO, and he's the IAM all rolled into one person. So they're not. Uh, I am expert with that, but can you recommend me the five top things I need to do today? So I, I agree very much, Jim. So or, we could like, conflate those two things. I think many companies are conflating those things, uh, but uh, there's a lot of potential there. And and uh, not to advertise that that's where we see as as, as a company saving and that's when and, and savvy that copilot. That's the direction we want to go to. Yeah, you know I think the. The way IEM is structured and has been structured for a long time, there's the identity data, access management data even, and then there's usually within business applications, there's some set of entitlement management. So it's very hard for me to go into my identity system and say, show me all of the permissions that allow somebody to enter an order in my yeah. SAP system. Right, because the IM system doesn't really know what are the permissions that let you enter, create an order. That would be revolutionary. If I could start to yeah. pull the, the data and put it through an AI engine, now I say, what are all the roles and permissions that could be assigned to somebody to allow them to enter order? 
can Henrique enter an order into my SAP system? What else can Henrique do in my SAP system? Wow. Yeah. That's powerful. And that gets to the core dream of what identity management should do, I think. I so, agree. I agree. I know we're kind of beating a dead horse, but and and I don't think that all the technology is there. But I mean that this it's not this is the first. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not there. We talk most of the time about this role that you had at Gartner, which was a a cornerstone and of your career. And I would say you reached the top of the mountain in the identity space, right? You became probably one of the most famous analysts at the most famous analyst firm focused on identity. What in the world made you give that up? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm very humbled uh, by, by the compliment there, Jim. And I thank you. Thank you, man. Um, uh, I, I cannot refute that statement. Um, but uh, uh, man, it, it was like you said, hey, uh, I, I was the chair of a summit, right? The biggest summit in IAM. I was writing the MQs, uh, was, got the promotion to vice president. I was super happy with everything that we accomplished at Gardner and, 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 and how many companies we, we helped. I think in summary, it, it was this. I, I was advising, like I said, in, in those inquiries and presentations that I, that I, was, I was delivering, I think we were touching so many people, right? And, and advising them in that short uh, period of time. But I said, how can it be that I'm still getting all those calls from clients that they're trying to solve IGA problems, like user onboarding, like the basics of the plumbing of identity management, right? Problems that uh, we started on this podcast here explaining Back then, back in the day, BMC software, uh, SailPoint, back in the day, we're talking about 25 years plus problem. So there's this guy, uh, his name is Yuri Levin. Yuri Levin, if you guys know him, he is the founder of Waze, right? Uh, and he said this thing, you got to fall in love with the problem, not with the product. So you got to fall in love with the problem, not the product. And... And I think that was reason number one. I mean, not that I love <laughs> IGA, I love guitars, but this is a problem that chased me. Like the question, the first question you guys asked me, did you choose identity or did it choose you? No, it, it, it been chasing me. Like this, this problem still persists, right? And Garner say, hey, 50% of IGA projects, they still fail. So number one, that problem was chasing me for my entire career for the last 25 years, right? Uh, so I, I want to solve this. Hey, I think it's, it's enough is enough, right? We should be able to be doing this, this basic thing of the plumbing of IGA. And then, of course, tackle uh, more sophisticated things. But uh, I think now technology is ready. And we have evolved in a way that, okay, now we can fix this in a universal way. And I want to <laughs> grab this problem by the horn and solve it. So that was the second thing. Right? So number one, the problem is still big huge for many, many leaders out there. Number two, the technology has evolved. And when I was looking at this market, I could have a very detailed, like uh, magnifying lenses in this market. So, save it. This, this is a company in the right size and the right speed of growth with a technology that we evaluated <laughs> as top of their class. And, um, and, and, and clients as well, very delighted with the experiences. You know what? This is a this is a good thing, especially if I could get into a, a position where I help that company navigate this, this very complex market, right? So that reason number two. Reason number three, uh, the people, right? Uh, the, when, when, and I, I know Sachin from way back, oh, more than 20 years when he was at Vayu. Vayu was one of the very first access governance tools, if you remember. There was Vayu, there was the Rikify, there was Avaxa. Right. And, and so he was already thinking about analytics back then. And we became friends toward, toward uh, this, this, this whole journey. And, and when he came back to save it, he raised even more money. He's a very smart businessman, but he's a very kind person. So uh, aligned with the way I think uh, to be inclusive, to be diverse. Right. And, and, and 
So values that were aligned where I think. So, so that was the third reason, uh, the right people, the right technology to solve the right problem. So, okay, I think it's time that I, I can take the next step in helping this, this problem to be solved. Yes, I, I did the advisory, I did this, this type of thing, but now, okay, I, now I, I wanna deliver the tools that can be more uh, actionable to really fix this once and for all. So, so that, that was the reason, uh, and Jim, and I, I never had this type of leadership role in a company and setting the strategy of a whole company. Um, so like, uh, like chairing an event, I never did that before. So I, I, I really am looking forward to what, what I'm gonna learn through all this journey. I think I'm gonna have a good time. I think I'm gonna have fun uh, worst case, I'm going to have this, this, this thing that I'll, I'll learn. I'll have the ability to apply this elsewhere. It's a great, it's a great uh, perspective. And again, it's, it kind of goes along with your story of being willing to try something new and ho- yeah. hopefully it works out right. You're obviously an optimist and yeah, fingers. fingers crossed it's going to work out. Um, and I wish you the best with it. Um, I wanted to bring up one last thing, which is, you know, Henrique, probably this this episode will get extra downloads because you're you're so influential, so well known. You've got over ten thousand followers on LinkedIn. Thank you. Yeah, th- I'm sure you're thanking all of your followers. But can you impart some of that to us so we know how to be more influential and to um, you know kind of follow the a similar path to what you did. Man, I again, I'm, I'm very humbled. Thank you, Jim. Uh, um, and I, 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 it took me a while to understand this whole social media thing. And and I'm a very self conscious guy, and I, I was always very afraid to to sound. Oh, this is self promoting. And and I created a a, a decision tree in my mind about things I would post. So if, if, if I can perhaps articulate this a little bit better is, am I helping some, somebody, All right? So, uh, and, and you, you may have seen that uh, I really like posting job openings in IAM because I, I love helping connect people like good professionals with good companies. Hey, I'm hiring an IAM leader. Or I'm hiring an IAM engineer because um, I, it feels good. I, I, I don't, I don't know if it's dopamine or what it is. It feels good. Hey, this guy got higher. Uh, and and, and it, in legit wishful idea of helping people. So that is the, the thing that clicked. Okay, I think I got it. Because to be self-promoting would be so cheesy. And I, I, I don't like that. I'm, I'm self-conscious. And I see when that comes out, it's not authentic. Right. And, but so the moment I decide, OK, ah, this is how social media works. It, 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 it's got to be something which is useful to somebody else. So even if I'm posting something about the event here, I take a photo or a silly selfie, which I'm trying to. Hey, by the way, I'm, I'm going to have brunch with with David Mari after this and we're going to have this selfie together. So people stay tuned. Uh, but even when when is that type of silly type of thing? Well, is it making somebody laugh? Right. So I, I, I'm a big fan of memes and, and, and cats and this type of thing in social media, because either you got to make people feel good or you are informing people about things. Hey, look, look at this research. that got published. Did you know X, X and X? Maybe uh, think about this. Maybe you could improve your life and what you're doing in your job. And if you can be funny. And informative at the same time, I think uh, it doesn't happen all the time and the things I post. But uh, 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 but I think that's that's the combination which makes that thing click. And of course, the, the following uh, uh, comes after that. But I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, I can connect with people and people can hey, Enrique, they, they, they wave me on the hallways and, and I was always humbled and uh, a little bit shy I'm, I'm a shy guy it may not sound it it's all a facade i'm, I'm a very <laughs> introvert very very much i'm an introvert and what changed is it's um, uh it's a lot of self-awareness uh who am i and, and how grateful i am to be here i think that's great advice i think that's something that we strive for here on a podcast is this term edutainment 
where it's educational yes. but entertaining. It's not boring. I mean, you know, Jim, you and I, we don't want to do boring stuff, <laughs> right? It's like, okay, there's plenty of that out there. How do we, how do yeah. we approach conversations and have fun with it and show some personality? And you know, are we perfect? No, but I think that's probably what you're going towards, Henrique. Is like, hey, you're you're sharing things, right? You're putting yourself out there and you're saying, hey, I think that somebody will find this helpful. And I think that's a great exactly. way to look at it. Don't, don't I, I? I don't take myself that seriously, right? So yeah, I, I'm just a guy. I, I'm a, I'm an immigrant from Brazil to <laughs> Canada today, and I, I speak funny. And and hey, uh, exactly. You got to combine those things, and uh, yeah, be we light put about on our, life. We all put on our golden podcast pants one hook at a time, just like everybody else. <laughs> All right, yeah. we're running short of time. RSA is act actively in flight for you. You're joining us all the way from San Francisco. So we want to let you get on with your day. But you mentioned uh, earlier when we were, before we hit the record button, that you've started to have more skiing adventures. And I'm curious if you'll share with mm -hmm. us as sort of the way to close out today's episode is any memorable experiences from those skiing adventures that you want to share with us? Man, I'm, I'm passionate about this. Uh, perhaps as a brazilian skier what's what's the odds right but uh um we we just had this fantastic trip uh that was my, my this last trip before joining savient uh and and it was the first time jeff that uh the four of us i have a 10 year old boy lucas and i have a six-year-old daughter livia and and my wife flavia and and the four of us is came together in, in the, the whole mountain, right? So we could go everywhere and we are in a level that of proficiency that we can ski together. So that, that was big. But the, the moment that really was a turning point for me and, and changed me as a father, right? Was when, um, was just Lucas and I were skiing together. And, and man, he, he's amazing. Both Lucas and Livia now, they're in the racing program of ski. And I was skiing with him in Canada. We were in Banff, one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, and, and was just he and I were going down this hill. And that boy was so fast. And I, I, I was having to, and he was nine at the, at the, at the time, <clears throat> nine years old, and was chasing this guy down the hill, saying, man, take it easy. Dad needs to catch up. And, and, and then I realized, wow, uh, for the first time you see uh, – your offspring has surpassed me. Okay, he's better. He's a lot better than I am at something. So, so Jeff, it was a mix of I was proud, angry at the same time. I, I, so it was a very interesting combination of feeling. But of course, I, 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 the, the the happiness was bigger than whatever other negative thing. I said, "Man, look at this dude!" And and I was, wow, he, he's better. So I I remember vividly when I realized that that this this little kid, uh, we we raised this kid, and okay, now he surpassed me. So I was, it, it got me thinking, oh wow, and 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 that will happen for everything, right? So when he becomes a better professional than I am, I hope, right? And, and, and he will be. I, I'm sure he will. Uh, a better human, a better person. He will be surpassing me in all these type of things. And my daughter, too, will surpass me. Uh, and it's, it's a, wow. This was a, a life-changing type of realization for me. Jim, what about yourself? You've got kids. I'm sure you can relate to your, your kids being better than you at something. <laughs> oh, my kids are better than me at a lot of things. But I'm just wondering, like, can we can Henrique guide two children to be better than him, better human being than him? And I think that's that that's that's something. Um, OK, my skiing skiing story is nothing compared to Henrique's. I grew up in Pennsylvania, which is the state in the United States where Pittsburgh and Philadelphia are. So it's like moderate winters. And what happens is it gets very cold and you'll get snow. And then it'll warm up and it'll start to melt, but then it'll freeze again. So basically skiing in the Pennsylvania mountains is like skiing on ice ships. So that's what I grew up doing from skiing standpoint. It's very scary, very, yeah. very scary. And so um, I'm not a very good skier. Um, I think it's pretty cool to do. But I also wanted to, to key off of Henrique's point about Banff. I, ha I have been to Banff, not during skiing season, 
man, it is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Right. That's right. in Al- Alberta, Canada. Yes. Yes. There's another story in skiing. And uh, you guys feel free to edit this and cut this out. But it was, again, Lucas and I. I think it was the same trip. Maybe another trip. But they were together. I was chasing him, of course. Right. And he got me to enjoy moguls and glades and trees. So if, if, if you guys are not familiar with skiing, glades, you ski in the middle of trees, right? And I never liked that. I, like, and, and he gave me the confidence. I was following him and chasing him. And uh, super fun. And I, I, that now for me is one of my favorite type of skiing is through uh, trees and glades. Uh, but that was this time. And I was chasing Lucas. And he making hard turns and I, and I I took the wrong footing on my skis on a, a wrong turn so I had to make in a millisecond I had to make a choice there was a tree in front of me so it's going to be either my knee or my nuts <laughs> so I I had to make a very quick like AI type of decision I said okay it's going to have to be the knees so I I talked with the knees and I hit the tree very hard <laughs> I was like, ah, in the ground like this. <laughs> Lucas stopped, and he was very worried. I said, Dad, are you okay? What happened? Oh, my God. I, I made you come this way. He was, uh, uh, he felt so bad of the situation. I was trying not to cry of, of, because I was in pain. Said, no, son, it's, it's, that is fine. That is fine. And, and then eventually... I shook it off and it went, but I, I thought it was the cutest. And that's why I think uh, this kid, yeah, he, he's going to be a better human than I am. Very <laughs> good entertainment, folks. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And that's why I don't ski. I've never been skiing. I've never done anything on the snow like that. I've shoveled it, and I think that's about as close to snow as I'm willing to get to <laughs> yeah. at this point. But, but yeah, I've never been skiing. Between your and knees that's and why. your... Yeah. <laughs> you chose correctly. I, you know, I, I think, you know, most gentlemen out there probably would think the same. <laughs> I know. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up for this week. Enrique, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you'll come back and join us again in the future now that uh, you're, you've are you got the shackles off and things like that. Um, and I'm sure we'll see each other. Will you be at Identiverse in a couple of weeks? I will, yes. Okay. Uh, yes. So fist bumps of gratitude will be there, and uh, looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. You can follow us on the web. We're at idacpodcast.com. We're on Twitter, X, whatever it's called when you listen to this, at IDAC Podcast. We've started our YouTube channel. We started to put more content on there. Videos like this, I hope, will be a video episode. We'll see. And um, let's see what else. Mastodon, InfoSec. I'm sorry, IDAC Podcast at InfoSec.Exchange. Connect with all of us on LinkedIn. We'll have links in our show notes for all of our discount codes. And don't forget that to do that cool subscribe and like thing uh, that helps us get great guests like Henrique and you know keeps, uh, keeps us motivated, keep doing the show. So with that, we'll go ahead and leave it. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll talk with everyone in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.